Hi everybody, welcome to uh, uh, this web chat show and today I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, my friend and colleague Patricia Fripp with me from San Francisco. Patricia Fripp and I always talk about uh, Brits being modest in their marketing. Patricia always nags me to be more upfront in, in marketing. My friend from Texas tells me I have to be more like a Texan, but actually I'm English and I'm British. But of course, Patricia Fripp's English and British as well as she keeps reminding me. And of course, she's from Wimborne in Dorset, which is one of my favorite places on the River Stour, um, which leads into Christchurch Harbour. Absolutely fantastic. Patricia, thank you so much for uh, joining me today, joining our friends from San Francisco, from America, and from all over the UK. And uh, we will, um, <coughs> all the, I'm going to, to ask you a few questions and hear your presentation. But um, I've got a couple of questions for you to start off with. You, um, you grew up in Wimborne in Dorset, and uh, you left school before you were 15 and became a hairdresser in Bournemouth. And in fact, in one of the best hairdressing salons in, in Bournemouth. And your dad took you down there. Did your dad really pay for you to, um, for you to take an apprenticeship? Yes, I left school 10 days before my 15th birthday. And that might seem very strange. However, if you were gonna serve an apprenticeship, they wanted you fairly young. And my father paid 80 pounds, around $250 at that time for me to serve an apprenticeship for three years. I earned 31 and fourpence, which was about four and a half dollars. It cost me two and a half dollars to get the work on the bus. And I gave my mother five shillings, about 50 cents for my keep, which is what we used to do in those days. And I would just, Derek, like to remind everyone to mute themselves as they come into the room. And the first day I went to work to serve my apprenticeship, my dad, who was a very successful, self-made entrepreneur, businessman in our little town, uh, he was in real estate, as we called an estate agent and an auctioneer. And as he pushed me out to work my very first day, he said, in your career, don't concentrate on making a lot of money. Rather, concentrate on becoming the type of person that people want to do business with, and you most likely will make a lot of money. Absolutely. And um, then you went to Jersey. You worked for Mr. Paul in Bournemouth, I think, and then you went to Jersey at a very young age. I don't think you could have been much more than 18. Jersey is an offshore island in, in, um, in, in the UK, almost off the coast of France, for those who aren't familiar with it, but it's a, it's a tax haven where uh, pretty rich insurance companies and banks go there to, uh, to hide some of their money, or they used to. What, what was that all about? Well, first of all, working for Mr. Paul was a great education because when you talk about marketing, it has to be based on good intentions, good business, and looking after your customers. And Mr. Paul, I saw him treat every woman who came in our salon like the only one in the world for the amount of time she was there. And I, when I was young, I thought, well, that's very nice. When I became a little older and a little more sophisticated, I realized what I saw him doing. He was as nice to the waitress in the posh Carlton Hotel as he was to the rich little old ladies who lived in the Carlton Hotel. And on reflection, I realized a waitress in a posh hotel in a holiday resort area had a sphere of influence a lot greater than the rich little ladies who just played bridge with her same six friends. So it was very good business because not every customer has as much money to spend. However, some have a sphere of influence which is more valuable than the money they spend. Then in Jersey, I was working with stylists from the West End of London who could do hairstyles I'd never even seen before. 
However, one day my boss, Mr. Steele, said, Patricia, you bring in 30% more revenue for the salon than the st other stylists. Now, the other stylists were more experienced, certainly more talented. However, they thought lunch hours were for eating lunch. And I realized eating lunch hours were for doing three more clients who could only come at lunchtime. Because if you were rich or if you're on holiday, you had more time. But if you were working for a living, your lunchtime was the only time you could have your hair done. And that just working through lunch hours brought in 30% more income. Now you realize the other stylists were making three times more money than I was base pay because they were more seasoned. And that's when I thought, wow, perhaps tenacity and the willingness to work hard has value. So where to promote it? Obviously the colonies. So when I was 20, that's when I arrived in San Francisco, no job, nowhere to live the equivalent of $500 and I knew everyone in America was rich and the streets were paved with movie stars. And my first job, Derek, was at the Mark Hopkins Hotel and we had people from all over the country and all over the world. So it was a great education. And in America, I discovered that hair stylists work 100% on commission. No guarantee, no sick pay, no vacation pay, just a percentage. And so I thought this was a license to steal. And working in a hotel, of course, you had guests. You could do well without having a clientele, which I didn't have fresh off the boat. And one day my boss, Mr. Paul, said, Patricia, I want you to go back to England and bring over 28 of your friends and I'll become a multimillionaire. And I said, I've never seen anyone work like me. You're lucky you have me. There aren't another 28 that I work with in England. Wow. So, so anyway. you actually thought that everybody was like you. Um, before yeah. we go totally yeah. into America, what tips did your dad give you? before you left because I know your dad was a very successful businessman in in uh, estate agency and he was an auctioneer as well well that was the one don't concentrate on making a lot of money oh. but rather concentrate on becoming a type of person you want to do business with however what I also learned from dad he was a founding member in the local in the local rotary club and just as Craig, the president of our Golden Gate Breakfast Club, which is in San Francisco, been established for almost 80 years. And the first group I spoke to outside the hairstyling industry, uh, it's, I knew from dad, you always do business with a Rotarian first. My dad always said, you try and do business with Wimborne. You promote your local area. He said, if you can't find what you want in Wimborne, okay, fine. However, always try and support your local community, your local Rotarians, your local breakfast club members, whatever your group of colleagues happen to be because there is a certain, whether we know it or not, and you're a great Cialdini fan as well, the, the law of reciprocation. When you do business with people, when you do favors for people, they feel obligated to return it to you. Absolutely, that's a fantastic uh, piece of advice. I better, we, we better turn to your presentation now, Modern Day Marketing. <laughs> Yeah, confessions of a shameless self-promoter. You know, I was wasn't sure my British friends would uh, would be able to handle that. That did sound a bit strong for uh, us modest Brits. I understand, and I am not saying you have to be a shameless self-promoter. That is what I call myself. However, there are principles, certainly, that do apply to all businesses. So let's, there we are in my beautiful retouched photograph, Derek. That's <laughs> Modern that's... day marketing. <laughs> 
All right, so let's. I have a home in Las Vegas as well as San Francisco. And when I first moved there, within the first four months, I saw Elton John, Cher, and Tom Jones perform, and they were absolutely magnificent. And then I realized I am watching them in my 60s, and I saw them all when I was in my 20s. And I thought, what is it that these stars did to maintain a fan base for 40 years? What did they do to attract new fans who weren't even alive when they were in their heyday? And what do they do to stay excited, involved, and popular in the very cutthroat business of show business? And then for a 43-year member, as I am now, of the National Speakers Association, what principles could I learn from them that apply for us? Now, Janelle and I are seasoned, longtime National Speakers Association, past president, still actively involved and in demand in our field. So for us, and I would suggest many of your guests, are uh, how do you remain relevant when we have been in our industry for a long time? And the premise of our presentation is simply this, Derek. What worked in the distant past and the recent past and now are all the same and they will work in the future. Which is why we decided to talk about my big beginning because principles are universal. They don't change. And although we have technology now, the principles behind good business are always going to be the same. And I was and just going to say it applies whether you're a speaker, whatever industry you're in, because we have a whole mix of people from different industries on the, uh, on the Zoom today, Patricia. So that's brilliant. And what are some of the industries? Some of the management, accountant, a coach, a finance manager, business process consultant from California. I had to be from California. I hope you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> a trainer, an author, an accountant, a real estate broker, and an HRIS consultant, whatever that means. That's my friend, Jill. All right, and, and the, the point of this is to make any presentation valuable for us as listeners is to listen and think, how can I apply or adapt this idea to my business? And this is why we focus on what I did as a hairstylist before I was a speaker. And this, is, this was me when I was probably about 28 years old. This was before I went into business myself, working in the first very fancy men's hairstyling salon in San Francisco when this was a new industry. And many people over my career who's missed my introduction said, where did you get your MBA? And I always say 24 years behind a hairstyling chair because I used my clients in the salon with rich clients in Bournemouth and in the financial district, I asked questions. I be a great education. What, what did you do in your company to be your best salesperson? Uh, what did you do to your company, your little company, the big company want to pay you millions of dollars? Good market research. And when I was working at Sebring's in the evening, I was amazed. So many of the people I worked with, and when I went into business myself, my staff used to go home in the evening. I used to go to Harpoon Louis, which was the local watering hole. I used to flirt with the cute stockbrokers and pass out my cards. Now, now we would call that networking. At the time, it was just flirting with the cute stockbrokers. <laughs> And nobody ever had to teach me, Derek, when I cut somebody's hair, I gave them three business cards. And I said, one for you, so you can call for your next appointment, and two for the next two people who tell you how good your hair looks. 
And the next time they came and I say, here's your three business cards. Yes, I know I still have the others. So I will give these three to the next three people who tell me my hair looks good. So that was an entrepreneurial background. Nobody ever taught me that. It just seemed common sense. Now, how often in all our businesses do people say, oh, please refer me. And when I um, asked that, I said, I'm happy to. However, when I meet a perfect prospect for you, how will I recognize them? We have to be specific in how our friends and colleagues and clients recommend us. We have to help them out. Don Collins was my stockbroker. Now, I had a stockbroker as soon as I got to America, I found a stockbroker because I was a great believer in investing because that's how I was trained. In fact, it might amuse you, Derek, that when I was at the Mark Hopkins Hotel, I'd get $7 in tips, which was a couple of pounds at the time. And I would walk to the bank and put my $7 in the bank because Charles said, you taught me how to speak, how to say, you taught me how to save. Because if you have money in your pocket, you will spend it. If it's already in the bank, you don't. Well, Don Collins was my stockbroker. And I said, Don, how do you get business? And he said, we cold call. I said, what's cold calling? He, he said, we call people we don't know and see if they want to do business with us. I said, does it work? He said, yes. Here's the name of six of my friends. <laughs> now, Derek, you understand. I was so young and naive. Not only did I not know what call, cold calling was, I didn't know people didn't like to do it. <laughs> you like flirting though, didn't you? I thought that was a great tip, by the way, five minutes ago. In the, right. in well, the but believe me, at my age, I, ha I can be friendly. I c it's a slightly different, uh, <laughs> different approach now. Brilliant. So I, I called Don's friends. I said, you know, I, I cut his hair. Would you like me to, you know, would you like me to cut your hair? Some people said yes. Some people said no. And some people said, would you give me my first hair cut for nothing? And this is my first best suggestion. It's better to do something for nothing than nothing for nothing. In other words, and this is how I trained hairstylists, especially when hairstyling was a new industry, it's much better to give a good experience and a wonderful haircut to somebody who is referred by a client who only referred people who could afford your service. And at least then you have your work walking around the street and you still say, here are three cards, two for the next two people, one for you when you want to come back, even if you didn't charge. So it's better to do something for nothing, for nothing, for nothing. And I have always been a great believer in publicity and press. You, I don't know if you can see, Derek, but this article was 1978. I can just see it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Now, something for nothing revisited in a more modern world. And he is on the call, Tom Drews. Now, Tom Drews is a handsome young man. He is single, ladies, and I do have his phone number and email and can be bribed. Tom came to the National Speakers Association of Northern California 20 years ago. And I met him and we were chatting. And of course, he's very handsome. I said, OK, if you want to, if you want to contact me, we'll go for a walk in the park. I live right near Golden Gate Park, and here is a message. We so often say, let's get together for lunch. If you are walking, one, you are both more creative. Two, it's an aerobic exercise. You don't have to worry about noisy people at the table next to you. It's much better to go for a walk. And I, as I do with all my clients, I always say, well, begin at the beginning. Give me an overview of your life. And when we got to one incident, I said, that's it. That's your first speech. 
he was a young actor in Hollywood and he went on the dating game. So that was his first speech. Now, 20 years later, he's a very in-demand speaker and trainer on time management and giving virtual presentations. And he still uses that story. It's always a winner. Now, this is my point. 20 years ago, I was... A, I was really in demand. And if people ask me to give a free engagement, I'm said, I'm sorry, I really would love to. I can promise you a speaker, but it's not going to be me. I have a friend, Tom. He is a great speaker. It's just he's early in his career, so he would probably do it for you. And Tom came back from a lot of these engagements, said, thank you. I made $15,000 out of that. And I said, Tom, if I'd known there was $15,000 in that engagement, I wouldn't have given it to you. Uh -huh. Now, here's the point, Derek. There are times in our career that we have more time than money. And there's time when we have more money than time. And I did not have a lot of time. I was traveling, I was moving, keeping up was, an, was enough. Tom had more time and he would say, yes, I would be very happy to give that speech for you. I understand you don't have a fee. However, could you get me 30 minutes with the training manager or the president or CEO or somebody who does have a budget for speakers? And the $15,000 came as a result of a free talk asking for that and got two days of training. So that's it. When you take, uh, you take an, uh, an opportunity now, Chris, financial advisor, Chris does not look like that because I didn't have time to ask her permission. But Chris came to my seminars, etc. And I said, Chris, what you might want to do, because you have a very good presentation. Now, understand when anyone on your call is thinking, Derek, I'm not a speaker. The best way the best marketing in your modern community, in your what the best modern day marketing in your community is to give a talk to service clubs. They can't be a sales presentation. It has to be informational. But that's how many of us began our careers. No, no idea that we would end up being professional speakers and consultants. So, Chris, I said, you have a very good talk. And she's a financial advisor. I said, a parallel industry for you might be the American Payroll Association, which is one of my best clients. I've been working for APA 24 consecutive years and even before that. So I said, the local chapters all over the country, they have no budget for their small meetings. But if you mention my name and say, I will be happy to speak for your meeting. I understand you don't have a budget. However, if my presentation as, is as successful as we both hope it will be, will you refer me to your state or regional conference, which has a budget? Now, once in a while, you just luck out. And the regional conference they booked her and paid her to speak at, Dan Maddox, the executive director, just happened to be there because it was one of their big anniversaries, 10 years or something as a chapter. And Dan was there and he heard her speak and he said, we don't normally hire financial advisors to speak at our conference, but your speech was very good. And I could tell you were very well-intentioned and not salesy. And he booked her to speak as a breakout session at the national convention. So that's just a matter of, and even if you want a speaker, if you have, give me one profession who isn't a speaker, Derek. Accountant. Accountant. Mm. Five questions, five questions to ask your accountant to know if they have your best interests at heart. That would be a great talk. One of my earlier talks was everything I learned about business, I learned behind the hairstyling chair. So any business you could come up with, 
A, five questions to ask your banker, five questions to ask your financial advisor, five questions to ask your hairstylist, five questions to ask fill in the blank to know if they have your best interests at heart. It, you can just write those five questions down give an introduction, thank you for the opportunity too. And, and, and then of course you write your introduction. And so the president or the program chair gives you an idea. In fact, for Craig on this call, you could say five, five ways good realtors can market your property that most are overlooking. All right. So remember, in any profession, it's better to do something for nothing than nothing for nothing. A perfect example is our friend Tim Durkin. I heard him speak on your chat show. I thought he was so good. I invited him to speak for the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. He was superb. One of my clients was looking for speakers and I, and I recommended Janelle and Tim and two others and, and the other eight that I have information on, they're hiring next year. And so that's it. He is, he's not with us now because he's rehearsing for the client. Had I not seen him on your show, he was very gracious to speak for the National Speak for the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. So it pays off. Brilliant. My second best suggestion is, now, this gets into being a shameless self-promoter. You might not recognize that photograph. It was in Time magazine in the, probably it was in the late 60s. It is Jay Sebring, who was a Hollywood hairstylist who became my boss, cutting George Peppard's hair for a movie called The Blue Max. Now, if you saw that movie, because some of you are old enough that you could have gone, please put yes, yes, yes in the chat. Now, Jay Sebring was a Hollywood hairstylist. He took over the salon I worked. And although you would not probably know this in England, uh, unless you saw the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, Tarantino's movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, where you would have recognized the name, you would have recognized the name, that the story was not 100% accurate because uh, Jay Sebring did unfortunately get murdered by... Charles Manson. However, and that's when I became the spokesperson and, and the, the face of the salon and the hair cutting styling movement in San Francisco. But Jay Sebring said, we have one gimmick in town, the best haircut. That's it. We have the best haircut in town. And it wasn't so much what he said as who he said it to. Time Magazine, Newsweek, Playboy Magazine in 1965 when no one else was talking about men's hairstyling. And he said, whenever uh, Herb Kane writes that I am now in town, the phone will ring off the hook. And it did. And at age 23, Derek, I realized from Jay Sebring, it does not matter how good I am. If I am the best in the city or the industry, if the world does not know, I will maybe make a comfortable living, but I won't make a mark. So that is when I became what I call a shameless self-promoter. And here's the secret. With all your promotions in any business, you start and you don't stop. Your efforts have to be ongoing, consistent, and relentless. What we do, and we need to do this on a very regular basis, is revisit, refocus, and rescript how we describe our offerings and our services. Now, many of us on this call, we built our businesses long before the internet. 
Now we have the internet. It is easy. Now, whatever profession you are in, and this is from a cosmetology magazine, 1969, Patricia Fripp, five foot one giant. So it's easy to begin in the industry that you are in. Now, let's go back to the type of values that I got from my dad. When it comes to promotion, Manny Lozano, who's a multi-millionaire client of mine in the salon, said, Patricia, even when you can't squeeze another customer in your salon, when you can't squeeze another stylist in here, you still keep promoting because you always have to resell the customers you have. This is still the place they want to come to. You see, you resell your customers. Don't think people remember you just because you sold them a house three years ago. Now, unless you keep in touch with them, and I'll say, I know Craig is superb at keeping in touch and using social media. So again, the principles that I used uh, in my hairstyling business, I use as a speaker, I now use as a consultant and coach. Ongoing consistent. Now, when you have information, when you have a magazine cover or a quote or a press, you repurpose it. So it has a lot more life longer than just this one entity. And if you have a website, make sure, Derek, I recommended you for a podcast. Is it on your website? It Do will you be have a press sure. and media page? Yes. So even now, maybe you don't have a press or media page, but maybe you might want to list not necessarily using their names, but the type of properties you've just sold or the type of clients you've served. Advice from a billionaire, Bill Gates. Ooh. And I'm a great admirer, not only of what Bill's done in business, but his philanthropy. He said, when you lose a customer, you lose first way, two ways. First, you don't get their money. And second, your competitor does. It is... And this is my fripicism. It is not your clients or prospects job to remember you. It is your obligation and responsibility to not give them the chance to forget you. Now, every Tuesday, we send out a mailing to everyone on our mail list. Now, not everyone opens them but at least they do, rec they do recognize my name. Any comments or questions before I get to my third best suggestion? Any, any notes in the chat I should know about, Derek? No, I think we're all right. I think one or two people are stunned with your number two suggestion of sending out a mailing every week and actually it's your job to uh, make sure your client doesn't forget you that uh, will certainly resonate over this side of the atlantic ocean and there'll be a few people scribbling notes i know well, well you do understand it has to be something of value that they might want and so it's in and i would say short uh, we send fairly short it's 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 a usually a video of the content and the script of the content. And at the end, it might be some call for action if they want something else. But the point is, if you don't give something of value, why would they open your mailings? Absolutely. So this is the next best suggestion is listen to your clients. They'll tell you what you want, what they want from you. Well, first of all, it's, if you remember, I have used my life as a hairstylist, as an education. I said to my staff one, 
you know, you're interesting women. Why do you t talk such a load of drivel when you have the best minds in the city? Now, it might interest you to know that all my earlier speaking engagements came from my hairstyling clients who were movers and shakers. And then now as a speaker and consultant, it's, it's taken a different tone and a whole different meaning. So this is what I want everyone to remember, whether it's a prospect, whether it's a customer, whatever the relationship, you're just getting to know someone. At a networking event, the key to connection is conversation. The secret of conversation is to ask questions and the quality of the information you receive depends on the quality of your questions. Now, for example, I get a lot of email inquiries from recommendations or from my website. So as soon as I get an inquiry, I, I look them up on LinkedIn and I send an email. Congratulations on your impressive career or something that I can know. Always talk about them first. And then uh, you need more information. The next logical step is us for have a Zoom call. Now I'd rather have a Zoom call than a telephone because you can build rapport a lot better when you're seeing people. And I always want to know, one, am I the end of a search or were you referred? Different conversation. And then when, if it is, a, now this is one of my best secrets. I do not give this out very often. This is a secret. I won't ask you to stop the recording for for YouTube, but when I get a prospect now, which is very often about coaching or coaching an executive, or might even be a sales team, I always say, Derek, let's have a pretend you already hired me call. <laughs> and if someone say, well, Patricia, how do you work with executives? I said, well, let's step backwards for a moment. If we were locked in a room together, what presentation would be, we be working on? And what I do, I directly work on the next presentation. And then I say, is this the type of help you're looking for? Now, often I find this is not a client I wanna work with. It, it works both ways. But I always say, there are a lot of great speech coaches who could give you great advice. However, it's also important that we have a great rapport with the audience with the person you're working with. So this is what I call, I sell by doing, I don't sell by telling. So just as in your mailings, on your website, and I will show your, your attendees, our, our pals, how they can get more information from me for free. Because if they don't like what you give them for free, why would they buy you? Which is why my first coaching call is free. Mm. It's, it's selling by doing. It's not selling by telling. Because honestly, Derek, you don't care how I've worked with every other executive. You really only care what's it going to be like if I hire you. I show them that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes. I love that. I love that secret of yours. Um, that would work across any industry. I was just musing on that, wouldn't it? Really? Of course. As, as an accountant or um, a finance manager uh, applying for a job or applying for a new client, let me uh, show you what I can do for you. Give me your accounts and let me uh, do you a couple of pages. Yeah, exactly. So it's giving them a taste of what it's like working with you and being generous. So any other questions or comments I should be aware of before I go back to my next point or two? No, there's just one or two, um, one or two nice things. Since your last pre presentation, Patricia, I've started using you language in the emails and use more verbs for action. Thank you from Elvira in Southampton. It made a massive difference. Well, wonderful, good. Now, hang on, I want to make sure I did this. I want to, yeah, that's good, perfect. All right, now in the National Speakers Association, a few years ago, we came out with a new philosophy and this transformed the business for many of us. See, we don't think of ourselves as speakers anymore. We are experts who speak. 
And how the question I introduced earlier was how do we stay relevant if you've been in an industry for a long time? And my secret is, and Janelle will live this out, and so have you, Derek, is you have to be multifaceted in your delivery. See, I'm an expert if I'm in a boardroom. You're an expert if you're in a training center, and you're an expert if this was Million Dollar Roundtable of 1,500 people. What surprised me, Derek, in that one was that 90% of them didn't speak English. <laughs> anyway, I digress. And so not only do, you, do we have to give our services in different size audiences, I remember the first time I looked out at six people and realized I'm getting my keynote fee to six people. And we also have to we have to all speak, coach, and train virtually. And for many of us, especially in our industry, we have an online offering and we have to put our expertise together in a proven system and repeatable process. So that's why, Derek, someone can bring you into one company and they move in a total different industry and they can hire you again because it's the process, it's not the industry. Now, for me, what happened was I was speaking, I was speaking at a big sales conference for a food company who sold in the hospitals. And the national sales manager came up to me and said, I liked your speech, but I loved how you delivered it. Could you teach our salespeople to speak that way? Because it takes us a year to be in a position to deliver a one hour presentation to a hospital board. It's worth $9 million a year if we get the business and we are losing sales and it has absolutely nothing to do with the price or our offering. It has to do with the presentation skills of our competitors. They're better than ours. And when I put together that program, Derek, certainly not nearly as good as I now do with my repeatable process, Little did I know that woman had just given me the secret of always being in demand, even when I didn't look quite as good on iMag. Because as a speaker, you can't expect to be flavor of the month for 20 years with all the speakers bureaus. So this is in any industry, we have to adapt. And that's another reason for refocus, revisit and, and rescript. My latest version of my website focuses a lot more on coaching than it does on speaking because that's really my bread and butter. All right, so now let's go back. In 2000, 60 Minutes, 60 Minutes came to the National Speakers Association Convention and they filmed five days, keynotes, and people were lining up to be interviewed dozens and dozens of them. And I was smart enough to know as I stood in line, if I'm going to get on 60 minutes, I have to say something interesting and pithy in one short sentence. You might consider it, Derek, a tweetable quote long before there was Twitter. And this is what I said. 60 minutes. This former hairdresser, like others in the trade, is a born talker. When I was a hairstylist, I worked on the outside of people's heads. Now, as a motivational speaker, I work on the insides of their heads. There's only half an inch difference. This former hairdresser. Derek, that line got me on 60 Minutes. That half inch has made me millions of dollars. And 60 Minutes, for our UK listeners, is like the one show on the BBC every night um, at 7 o'clock in the evening. Yeah, it, it's, it's probably the most, I believe it's the longest running news story format show. Very popular in America. And... Uh, so, of course, all the millions of dollars has been in my combined career, Derek. It hasn't all been in one year. Fantastic. But my fourth, my fourth best suggestion, whether you, whether you, whatever you are, 
whatever your profession, you can be an accountant, you can be a financial advisor, you can be a realtor, you can be an ambitious HR trainer and leader in your company. One, it is so much easier now to get knowledge and information. So for example, here, this is the Patricia Fripp YouTube channel. You might want to go in and subscribe and watch. There are over 600 videos, short, interesting, that are a way to educate you. Now for anyone, and you know this, Derek, and is doing it very, very well, is you add your content to a YouTube channel, uh, the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. We have a, a channel where we put all our speakers and it's a great way to promote because YouTube is at least the second most popular search and very often sometimes it's the first. Mm -hmm. Now it might interest you to know that this time last year, the people who watch my YouTube channel more than any, like 90% were young men from 20 to 34. Now it might also interest you now that my 89.9% .9 of my followers, these are my subscribers and people who watch, even if they don't subscribe, the people that watch me are men between 20, 55 and 64. So at least it's getting more age appropriate. But if you think of that, it's younger people earlier in their career and now people who are more mature that want to stay up and be hip and competitive. That's my market. Although I think women love me, but most of the people who watch me on YouTube are men. Now for anyone, if you have one, I give you one specific question. If you email me pfrip at frip.com, one specific question, short and pithy, it might be if you had a title, I'm a realtor. Here are five ideas for an article to write, a blog post, or a YouTube, or a speech for a service club. Five ways, three. I'll, and, and in your email, you need to say Derek Chat in the title so I know where it comes from. If you go to frick.com forward slash handouts, you'll find there are special reports, uh, my latest uh, article, which is how to how to speak and train in the virtual world, beautiful PDF, and I have events. I have any event that is free to the public or very low fee, like an NSA chapter, is on my website. For example, October the 6th, I have a free webinar, Fire Up Your Presentations. I have 900 plus blog posts on frit.com and the YouTube channel, all free, all free. Help yourself. And this, when you go to the handout page, not only do you have wonderful handouts, you have some videos there that you might want. So the question is next steps to make it happen. All I can encourage you and challenge you is one, to take advantage of opportunity. To two, revisit what you did early in your career to make you a success. Whatever you are doing now will be built on those foundations. And most wisdom comes from reflection. Think back to what did your dad, what did your earlier boss teach you that you might want to pass on or revisit? Does that still apply? It does not matter how good you are. The world has to know about it. And it's so much easier now with social media to do that. All promotion and business has to be built on a strong foundation of certainly giving the best service and really having best intentions for your customers or clients. And then something for nothing is better than nothing for nothing if it can help promote you. When you ask for referrals, be specific. Mm -hmm. And if you can summarize what you do in a tweetable quote, it'll be your advantage. So next steps to make it happen, you have examples of what, what is available free. So much information is now free or low cost to educate yourself. So it's really up to you. The fact that you sign in to 
Derek's web chats once or twice a week proves that you are a lifelong learner and welcome to the future. If you're just a tad more self-promotional, even if you wouldn't call yourself shameless, I promise you, your future can be bright. Derek, I could take one question or listen to one comment, then I have to go to my paying customer. Patricia, we've got some comments in the box. I'm going to fire them away very quickly. Have you ever managed to get a client to agree to a percentage of the increased, of increased sales? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Okay, next question. When you were hairdressing, did you do anything to select your clients with an eye to the future, the ones that might have had more money than the others? E.g. men at that point, maybe. Well, well, the last 15 years of my clients were all men, from 23 onwards. From 15 to 22, it was women from 23 to 39. When I retired from that business, it was all men and movers and shakers. But remember the waitress at the Carlton Hotel. It's not necessarily only the money, it's the sphere of influence. Did you do that deliberately? Did you switch to men when you went to San Francisco deliberately? No, I worked in the Mark Hopkins Hotel on women. And then that was when the first men's hair styling salon opened. I went and applied for a job. And that is a whole story in itself. But And when Jay Sebring was murdered, my best friend Frankie said, you know, you're going to now be the star of the salon. I hadn't realized it, but, but I was. And fortunately, I had the personality and the pizzazz to step up. Patricia Fripp, that was absolutely fantastic. And I know that you have to go straight away. You said six o'clock and we've nearly outstood our welcome. But can I thank you once again for coming on my chat show, once again for coming up with all the wisdom that you come up with and can I ask everybody to give you the usual round of applause, please, uh, for just doing such a uh, fabulous job. And I hope we will see you again in another few months time, please. That would be fantastic. Uh, yes, and certainly we have a great speaker at the Breakfast Club on Wednesday. Maybe Craig wants to put uh, a link or his information. We have a great speaker who is an actor and speaker, Derek. Well, I sent you the information uh, to you if anyone wanted it. He is talking about origin stories and how good it is in your marketing. And anyone who is interested in great speakers, stories, or marketing would love our, our speaker on Wednesday. With that, I got to go. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Patricia. I'll stay on, for, on the line for any questions or anything that people want to ask. Thanks a lot. Bye.